Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys. Uh, so, I, I really enjoyed learning about Napoleon this past year. Um, you know, I, I've loved learning about a lot of historical figures, but Napoleon is, has really been enjoyable for me. But from all the history, um, the epic history TV videos I've, I've watched, maybe I've seen a few ep uh, kings and generals, I, I, I've never really heard about him at Trafalgar much. Nor have I heard about him in, in Northern Africa and, and in, you know, in Egypt. And so, History Hits, a great channel. They have a, a video on it. Let's do it. My name's Connor. Hello. Original link, top description, Discord. There. Let's go. So, the Army of Italy is, is relatively small, 20,000, 30,000 men. Poorly supplied neglected really compared to some of the other fronts on which there's been more fighting over the last year or two you know, armies in the north have been winning some great victories in 1795 so napoleon goes to this army and presents himself in a sense as their savior that he is the man who is going to lead them on to greater things he famously says to them that you're, you're, you're here and you, you've got nothing you've got no boots you've got no money you've got no food there is italy it's full of wealth and, and we're going to go and get it and it'll be, it'll be glory for you, glory for us, glory for me. And that's very much the spirit that he takes into the campaign. There is a kind of freebooting, almost piratical mixture of motives. But at the same time, it's also about France and glory and representing a wider ideal. His enemy was the Austrian Empire, whose forces vastly outnumbered his own. Not one to be intimidated by the task ahead of him, Napoleon immediately went on the offensive. He moves fast. Um, he often moves unexpectedly as far as the enemy is concerned. So there's that vigor, which often is missing on the Austrian side. You follow through. He's got that great eye for geography. He can see where to advance, where to cut off enemy supplies, where to make the enemy feel that they can't retreat if they need to along their own supply lines. Napoleonic warfare, which really starts in this period, is characterized by rapid movement. And in Italy, through 1796 into 97, he consistently outmaneuvers the Austrian enemy, pushes them out of a whole range of different territories. And the Austrians, by the autumn of 1797, sort of throw in the towel. It's made easy for them in that Napoleon Bonaparte, again, acts pragmatically and doesn't... So, guys, this is after that, what is it, Toulon or, or something? What it, the, the city in southern France on the Mediterranean where he kind of starts his way to become the Napoleon we know him. So, so this is after that. Is it Toulon? I, I, I could be completely butchering it. I'm not afraid to sound like an idiot. Um, and, and so this is after that, and he's still not the guy. Trade with them. So the Austrians actually receive Venice in return for territories which they're forced to give up, in effect, to France. And I think what is significant there from the point of view of Napoleon's career is that he's starting to act as a as statesman as well as a soldier. He is making high-level geopolitical decisions without much reference to the government in Paris, it, it might be said. They have to basically accept what he signs up to. Napoleon's a great battlefield leader. He's a great military leader in the, in the narrow sense. What he also starts to show during the years in Italy is his very strong conviction of himself as being entitled to be a political leader as well, of being entitled to be treated almost as a monarch. And while he's there in Milan, he bases himself in what is effectively a palace and actually enlarges it and has big marquees put up in the gardens of the palace so that more people can come and pay court to him, so that it becomes the kind of place where you have to come if you want anything from the French authorities and present yourself to Bonaparte, who is sitting there in a throne room waiting to have these audiences with you. And he sets himself up like that very clearly um, and then when he goes back to Paris at the end of 1797, he very carefully leaves all that behind. And he, he goes into Paris in an ordinary coach dressed in civilian clothes and presents himself very humbly to his political masters. 
because he's playing both sides against the middle. He, right, maybe he doesn't want to be seen like too much of a threat to upper Paris people. He, he likes being in charge, being, being the unquestioned leader and ruler, but he knows that if he's not careful, he'll just get chucked in prison. So he's, he's playing a game of power very clearly for, from these days in Italy onwards. Napoleon returned to Paris a hero. The 28-year-old had defeated the Austrian... I'm 28. What am I doing? ...Austrian Empire, all while more experienced French generals had made little ground in the northern battlefields of Germany. Now it was time to turn his attention to France's greatest enemy, the British. But rather than confronting this northern foe with a direct attack, he looked to the east. The idea of looking eastward, looking to the Levant for some kind of strategic advantage is not unusual. It's been part of French long-term strategic thinking. What they're looking at by 1798 it's, it's an interesting amalgam of ideas. One is that the, the confrontation with Britain to the Northwest has really ground to a stalemate. And they're looking around for another way to kind of break out of that sort of simple army versus navy dichotomy they've got there. The Mediterranean, of course, is much more difficult, at least theoretically, for the British Navy to operate in. Napoleon persuades the politicians in Paris, who were easily persuaded, because after all, Napoleon by now is rather popular. He's extremely good at publicity and organizing publicity and organizing networks of influence. And he is spoken of as someone who ought to have more of a political role in Paris, which the politicians, of course, Sorry, is it just me, or does he kind of look like Rambo right there? Like a Sylvester Stallone Rambo? Is that just... I don't know why. ...who ought to have more of a political role in Paris, which the politicians, of course, the directory, don't want to know. And so Napoleon was allowed to set off for Egypt. This is the first time me hearing about anything Napoleon in Egypt. Following in the footsteps of two Caesar. of his greatest idols from antiquity. For Napoleon, you know, he's going to be operating this sort of exotic place where Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great have been conquerors. You can see how it's going to trigger the imagination of Napoleon. Napoleon wants to go to the East because, as he said, the East is where all great glory comes. It's, it's so amazing when, like, when we look at stuff from hundreds of years ago, we tend to see it as, like, classic. And it, it's so cool to, like, see something from over 200 years ago, someone trying to mimic something else from thousands of years ago. And it, there's something so cool about that. Comes from, and he very clearly wants great glory. It's not about what he can do for other people. It is very much clearly about what he can do for himself to become greater. And he'll take to Egypt both, obviously, his military force and also this remarkable scientific force that he puts together, who, yeah, several dozens, hundreds of scientists and their associates who will found something called the Institute of Egypt, paralleling the National Institute of Sciences, which has been set up in Paris. They're going to investigate Egypt as a source of economic power, as a source of raw material, as well as somewhere where the French can get more influence going east towards India. They're going to Egypt, which has been most recently, of course, part of a Muslim empire with a language which they didn't know. Almost no one on those boats going to Egypt had any knowledge of Arabic. And what knowledge they had was classical Arabic. And what they given to inform them about Egypt was what they'd read when they were students, which was Herodotus and his absolutely brilliant account of the society and culture of, of ancient Egypt. Google Translate. Most of them also are dual purpose, these intellectuals, so they do have a function with things like sort of military logistics and administration. But in the other half of their, their professional lives, they're, they're taking sketches of these wonderful monuments which they see, of cataloguing, of collecting, and of discovering objects like the Rosetta Stone and of, in many ways, creating that model. Napoleon found the Rosetta Stone?
modern subject area of Egypt. There's no way. Wow, it was discovered in 1799. Oh my god, holy crap. Ontology. The Egyptians hadn't really seen a military expedition on this scale. Certainly not the Egyptians who were alive at the time. It is, a, it is a colossal military expedition in terms of number of ships and in terms of number of troops who the French bring over. So I think one could talk about shock and awe in, in the initial sort of phase. Napoleon makes all sorts of promises. He adopts language which he thinks will be appealing to Egyptians. Looking at how Napoleon approaches the, the contemporary population of Egypt, there's also some very deeply negative aspects there. They go in with this very superior enlightenment attitude that you can simply, you can exploit Islam. You can, you can lie to people and say that you're sympathetic to Islam oh, and then they will obey you. And uh, particularly early on in the French occupation, there are some very cynical attempts to persuade the general population that French republicanism, because it's anti-Catholic, is, is pro-Islamic. I'm so desensitized to any sort of lying to locals or, or pinning. It, it, it's, it's odd when it doesn't happen. That's what I find. And when it comes to empires exploiting, um, I, I'm not in the business of, of, I'm in the business of looking at history and wanting to learn history. As far as the morality of stuff goes, it's always good to talk about, but everyone who gets the power to do something ends up being that thing that they before saw as sleazy. And anyway, so before this point, because um, the Rosetta Stone allowed people to understand uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, right? Because at, it 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 showed Latin or it showed Hebrew, Latin and Arab or Greek. Anyways, uh, so before that, that they couldn't understand Egyptian hieroglyphics. Um, and it it is all entirely sort of superficial and cynical and manipulative, and it's also associated again with projecting Bonaparte as a kind of personal savior that he is somehow involved in this syncretic image that they want to put forward, not just as the leader of the army, but as, as himself, as, as a leader whose personal qualities will, will bring good things to the Egyptians. But of course, in practice, as, as many people will find when they get occupied by a Napoleonic army, it is, it is a question of looting and requisition and theft and physical abuse. Sorry, look at this guy over here. He's like, oh. And requisition and theft and physical abuse. Uh, and in the, in the end, a, a thoroughly unpleasant occupation experience for the Egyptians. But things quickly... Just as I said a few seconds before, I don't care. I'm not really interested in the morality and stuff. This is literally a guy with naked women just being... Like, hello, would you like this one, right? He, that's crazy. And physical abuse, uh, and in the, in the end, a, a thoroughly unpleasant occupation experience for the Egyptians. But People things are... quickly turned sour for Napoleon. Thinking he was out of reach of the British Royal Navy, he was caught off guard when Admiral Horatio Nelson destroyed the French fleet in the- Two men I admire. Battle of the Nile. In true Napoleonic fashion, the French general did not stay put for long, instead choosing to go on the offensive, hoping to meet the British-backed Ottomans who were marching towards him head on. The campaign which takes place How have I never heard of ultimately this? is a failure for the French. Um, they don't achieve their objective, which is to halt the Ottoman advance. 
but you do get a couple of episodes which are important for Napoleon's um, reputation. And one is the, the massacre of Ottoman prisoners, which is, is a dark episode, even by the, the low standards of a period. It's controversial. And the other is where he... They executed people by cannon? I'm not saying that would be less brutal than by musket, but it... The period, it's controversial. And the other is where he is seen to heal and to, to, to sort of touch the, the plague victims. Plague is still rife in that part of the world in, in the late 18th century. And there's this very famous painting which shows Napoleon almost as a Christ-like figure. that their face is terrifying. Touching these people who are afflicted with plague, he's, he's brave enough to, to do that. It's that sort of care which he shows for the ordinary French soldier, at least that reputation which he acquires, which makes him so popular amongst the ordinary French soldiers. The Egyptian campaign was a failed campaign, militarily. But Napoleon managed to get himself and his close associates back to Paris quickly enough before the politicians in Paris realized it had been, it had been a failure. Hey, that's kind of like just exactly what happened with Caesar when he went to visit and he was presented with Pompey's head. You know, like it, it, it was kind of a, you know, didn't Caesar fail there too pretty badly, but ended up being able to salvage it? What Napoleon does is abandon his army in Egypt. And that, again, is one of those turning points in his life that we have to acknowledge. He had no orders to return to France. His army had partly successfully, partly unsuccessfully expanded the area under control. But it was becoming clear to him that a stalemate was going to I'll ensue. I'll be right back. And he'd started to hear rumors that things were going on in France that might open up other possibilities for him. So in, in the middle of 1799, he is ironically welcomed back into France. All that they have heard is his propaganda about how wonderfully things were going in oh. Egypt. Check out the History Hit YouTube where you can get great exclusive videos and a sneak peek at what's available on the world's best history channel, History Hit TV. It's going really fast. We're thrilled to have you all aboard. Extremely fast. Jon Snow, amazing. Um, okay, I gotta find... I, I haven't seen the episode with the Endurance. I've been waiting. Ooh. Uh, Prince Bagration. Really great video, guys. Um, uh, yeah. See you guys next time.